When ready. Okay, we can begin in five, four, three, two, one. What? It's fragments of silicon time again already? <laughs> indeed it is our rare but not unprecedented thursday show as um well we mentioned previously uh we had some scheduled conflicts for tuesday so we're doing it here on thursday like and um joining us this week is rick banner of the game creators hello yeah yes i'm glad to be here indeed indeed right so um i'm gonna preface this by mentioning um, especially if you haven't seen like our other episodes this week, um, this is going to be a bit of a different interview uh, because we are not actually covering a game. Um, we are covering game uh, creation software. So bear in mind with that. But um, before we get into all of that, um, we'd like to get to know the person behind the product. So um, what got you interested in gaming in general? both on a personal and a professional level? Well, it's a, it's a long story, but I'll, I'll try and keep it quite short. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a bit older than Intel. I think they're 50 uh, this, this week, and I'm 50, 51. Um, so you can see I've been in the industry for a long time. I was in, in the 80s when I was at school. Uh, the 8-bit revolution was starting. So um, we had things like the ZX80 in our country, and the ZX81, and that was the first computer I uh, considered possible to buy, because at the time, computers were just run by scientists, and huge rooms were full of, you know, these VAX machines, and it, it didn't seem possible that someone could own their own computer. And I was in the middle of uh, sort of high school, if you like, and I didn't take computer science, because it, it was a new subject. I thought, I'm not going to be able to do that. So anyway, the ZX81 came out, and I thought, you know, I, I, I wouldn't mind trying that. It was only £100. So um, I got one, and it had basic programming on it. And a uh, magazine started to come out that showed you how to program. And that got me into it. Uh, obviously, we'd had the Atari VCS released. So that was the eight, the first sort of uh, mass market uh, video game in the home. And to be able to write your own game, that was a dream. It just, it just imagine, you know... You, you thought that scientists could only do these things, but there, all of a sudden, in a very short time, it became feasible that I could do it. And by typing in these programs that were listed in magazines, um, I, I found out I could do it, even though my first games were pretty poor. Um, yeah, and, and, and from there, I moved on to an Atari 400, which had more colours and more memory, because the ZX81 had 1K, you imagine that 1k but that <laughs> you didn't really think about how much that was you just wanted to make something appear on the screen and from there um, i went to college i did more computer work and then i got a job with a company and uh, they were doing games and also things like uh, sort of office type programs uh, a simulator for the red arrows and i got working for them and i ended up moving away from programming actually and became became of a product manager and so that's how i got into it uh so it was very early days there, there were no real courses at university and things like that i just sort of you know got into the industry when everyone else was sort of starting to get into, into the industry and the industry was only just you know beginning uh there were no charts and things like that it was very very early days sounds like it i mean we're talking about, you know, Atari 8-bits and the ZX81. Um, like, that, that's even before the Spectrum. Yeah. Well, well yeah, I, I remember getting the Spectrum uh, brochure and going into school and saying, my God, this has got, you know, eight colours. 
and it's got more features on every key. Now that was a feature, having more features on a key. And it it, it was at this time where every time every month there was a new announcement from some company, you know, a new computer here, a new it was it was crazy. Uh, very it's very exciting. I I can imagine like um maybe not to the uh, like to that extent, but um, you know, I I've I grew, you know, I grew up with computing in the '90s, and that was its own um, frenetic pace. <laughs> Absolutely, uh, you know, the internet kicked off. You know, I, rem I remember my boss saying, "Can you have a look at this internet thing?" Because, <laughs> you know, we were just we, we were all working with floppy disks and and cassettes, and well, I think we moved away from cassettes by then. But um, I looked at this internet thing, and it, it was made up of a number of different modules. And I said, "Well, this web thing looks quite interesting." And you know, no, no one had emails, you know, email addresses either. We didn't use email. We just sent things in the post. You know, we had a developer in France actually who sent all his bills in the post, and I would then load them up, and I would send him a, a, a fax of, of any bugs I found. That's how basic it was, and even the fax machine was really slow. So yeah, the internet uh, kicked off in the middle of the 90s, and obviously the games machines were getting better, but you were very much you had to buy cartridges or discs and yeah uh, and that's what's been great about the in industry as i've seen it through the decades you think oh it's going to get a bit boring now but no something else always seems to come along you know smartphones is a, is a great example because pc was sort of like dominant around that time and, mm -hmm. and phones were a bit basic and and it was very hard to write things for phones because it was all controlled by the the operators but then the, the apple phone came out obviously the iphone and that just made it more, much more exciting and things like vr and ar are now you know uh, the next sort of uh, exciting areas indeed indeed there, so even though i've been in it a long time i still have a lot of passion for it and, uh, and uh, although the same things get repeated quite a lot just like they do in movies and tv programs you know mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing how detailed big games have become the size of the teams that require to build them um but at the end of the day, there's only you know there's, there's some guy who has to or or girl has to write a menu system or an AI routine, and it's then being able to manage all those skill sets together to make these big games. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like yeah. Um, you literally need hundreds of people to build uh, a triple A game in today's uh, oh yeah atmosphere. I'm just playing Assassin's Creed Origin, mm -hmm. and I'm blown away by the size of it. It's like it's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, they, you know, and, and just to, to, the, knowing what goes into these things, because I've worked on games before, and um, mm -hmm. that it's just the amount of work and effort and make everything work together. Um, yeah, it's to do it to do it right is is very hard, and that's why there's been lots of bad games in the past because you make one mistake and and the whole game falls down. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was an article about that not too long ago about aliens that. they um misnamed a module and it broke the ai forum aliens colonial marines yeah i'm like yeah. uh you know uh, it wasn't even the module is the any file mm -hmm. but yeah what that did was it, it gave what false registers to the ai so, mm -hmm. and that's why it was corked up there i mean yeah, it made it so it didn't know where it was supposed to go or be, so it just kind of ran at you yeah. instead it, of, it you know... It tethered it to a player, player instead of tethered. Yeah. <laughs> God. Oh. I'm like, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of moving parts. I mean, another good example is Assassin's Creed. Uh, Assassin's Creed Unity had that um face yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i still have nightmares of that understandable it was uh, yeah. horrifying no. yeah and then that's you know the big the big uh, publishers they have release dates they have to hit and then they just deal with it in a patch which is a bit you know it's not great if you have to do that but um hopefully they get the deal with it eventually but it, you know I think that they need more time. I mean, the big games tend to push their release dates until they've they've dealt with all the polish. Because, you yeah, know, one little change. It's a bit like, right, I always say to people who don't understand programming, say, imagine you've written a book. Because uh, if someone says, can you just change this? Well, imagine you've written a book and you just, you've just changed the character's name. You're going to have to go through the whole book and 
and change references to that. And that's a bit like programming. You know, you can't easily change things without affecting everything else. Um, and it's yeah. always best to start with the end in mind. You know, if you've got a very clear plan, I think that helps. But some of these games maybe start off with with an idea and, and evolve and, and then got to be fixed and patched or changed completely. Anyway, we're getting off the tangent, I think. But, um... <laughs> it happens. It, <laughs> yeah. It happens. I'm like, um, and, it's got, and it is relevant to the subject matter at hand here because, yeah. I mean, you don't want to talk about programming. You, well, it's like... Uh, so I, I say I self-taught myself. You know, there was there was no. I didn't take the course at school. I ended up going down to the library, finding a book on BASIC because I didn't really know what that was, and started reading that. I mean, just reading. I didn't have a computer, so I read it. It's a bit crazy, but I couldn't ask my dad or my brother because they were bakers. They weren't going to help me, and um, yeah, I just sort of slowly taught myself. I was passionate enough. I think if you've got the energy, the passion, you want to make it work, you can do it. Um, but it's not just simple load it up and drag and drop things. You know, that's it. Those are the easy game makers. Uh, we, we obviously want to make things easy like that in the future, but you've still got to do the, the logic. The logic and how things interact with each other needs programming. So that's how I started my, my journey. And when I worked for this other company called Europress at the time, this product came in from a French company and it had a, a number of different things in it. And one of the things in it was called STOS, and it was a basic programming language. And I thought, well, this is really good. You know, I can write a command and put a sprite on the screen. Whereas at that point on an Atari ST, you had to, you know, understand Lattice C and do compiling. And it was a nightmare because there was no there was no internet. You couldn't Google it. Right. <laughs> and there were no manuals. Uh, but this thing had just simplified the whole process. Um, so as a publisher, we, we just took that aspect and, and sold that as a game creator. You can Google that, Stoss. And you should be able to find that. And then we did an Amiga version called Amos. Um, and uh, that was really successful. And again, it was, it was sort of like core basic programming language within it. After that, we did a product called Click and Play. Uh, and also a version of that called Click and Create, which was sold to Corel in the in Canada, I think they were. Um, and um, that was more drag and drop. And that became Multimedia Fusion, which is sold by a company called Click Team in, in France. I was about to say, didn't that become multimedia? That's right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's my history on the, on the game maker side. We also worked on things like Rally Championship, which was one of our sort of game brands. Uh, that was an uh, exciting time to work on that. Um, and then somebody at the company that was who I was working with, called Lee Bamba, um, I went up to work with on the rally, but I said, Lee, you know, let's do a PC... Uh, sort of basic programming language. And he made, while I was away doing Rally for two years, he made this thing called Dart Basic. And um, th that particular company ended up selling, and, you know, we finished that. And I joined up, to it, joined up with him again, and he'd made this Dart Basic. And I said, OK, I'll, I'll come on board with you, and we'll get it marketed and, and get it into selling on the internet. And it, that was around 1999. So uh, we did really well with Dart Basic. And then we made a number of game makers after that, things like the 3D Game Maker for, for kids, FPS Creator, I don't know if you've heard of that, very simple way of making your own first-person shooters. Um, but Dark Basic, because it was on a PC and it was only one platform, things were going cross-platform, and that's where App Game Kit started in the early sort of, God, where were we, to 2001 around that time. We said, look, we need something cross-platform because Unity was out, Unreal Engine. So our game kit was started from scratch, but based on sort of dark basic principles in that it's an easy-to-use language. So you've got sprite commands, you've got 3D commands, um, music, sound. In fact, right today, up to that, you know, there's a 1,900-plus commands in it right now. So <laughs> it's quite complex in the sense that there's a lot of commands in there, but that means it can do a lot for you. You know, you can load in an image with a, a load image command and then with a sprite command you can position it on the screen and have it moving around under your control um, so that's where app game kit came from and it was also tied up with the time when smartphones were coming out so ios was new um, android was very new um, things like samsung barda 
uh, was another platform which we did actually develop for. But things have simmered down now. You know, we've got you can use App Game Kit on a PC, on Mac and Linux, and then you can compile your basic program to then work on PC, Mac, Linux, Android, or, or iOS. So if I write a game like Space Invaders in App Game Kit, it will then spit out and work on those platforms without me changing it. And that's the power of App Game Kit. Uh, but also we, we, we have um, C++ library. So if you're more of a serious developer and you know C++, then you can call our libraries and use all that power within the engine as well. I don't want to get too techy because, you know, maybe your audience isn't into that side of things. Um, but if you wanted to learn to program, have a, have, check out the, the free trial and there's got plenty of demos in there. And you can just sort of step through the, the commands and, and see how they work. Right. Um, and then we, it, we, our, our community is really passionate and, and some of them have made like a Python ver version, a C Sharp version and a Java Kotlin version. So we're expanding out into more areas in which you can use the App, app Game Kit uh, library of commands. So you would say that the App Game Kit is um, aimed towards um, people who are just starting out? Well, we're, our, our, we've, we've, you know, we've um, done a number of surveys with our community, and the majority of people are hobbyists. So they, they've got an idea, they want to program something up, um, because most people, you know, work, for, you know, if they're, if they're at home, they're not going to be a band of 10, 20 people trying to make a, a hit iPhone game because it's very hard to do that now. You know, the big companies have sort of taken that uh, part of the market now. But a lot of people want to just create something for themselves and share and maybe publish onto Google Play, and they can do that. Um, so I always say about 90% of the people who use our tool are hobbyists, and then 10% are probably indie developers who are using it to do their own apps and, and monetize from there. Um, we actually use App Game Kit on a product called Driving Test Success. We developed it, um, and it's published by a company in the UK called Focus Multimedia. It is the number one driving test app in the UK, and it's usually number one in the iOS and on the Android pay charts every week, every day. Uh, it's become that successful, and that's all within our engine, in the basic version of it as well. And that's actually fueled uh, us adding features. So like there's a part of the driving test in the UK where you've got to um, spot hazards in a video. So we added video into the engine, you know. So it's been a quite a good process that doing this successful app sharpens the sword of the engine and vice versa. And we add things that our community wants as well, not just one-sided one thing either. And... Um... I suppose my next question is, how do you uh, make your uh, software creation suite here stand out amongst the titans that are like Unity or Unreal? Um, well, that's pretty pretty difficult for us to do, really, because, you know, they are U.S. companies. They are heavily funded by venture capital. We're, we're self-funded. Um, so I would say we're, you know, maybe below them in a tier of, of other game makers. It's, it's very difficult for us to do that. Um, but we just keep focusing on what our community wants and, and showing that we're constantly developing the product and um, aiming to try and at least catch up with the sort of feature sets they have. The benefit of using App Game Kit, I mean, I know these big guys say, oh, it's free to download and free to use. But, you know, if you get something successful, you will be paying them a fair bit of money. I mean, um, you know, Unity Pro is not free, and if you get a successful product on Unreal, you're going to be paying a big license to them. Even though it's 5%, if you're making a lot of money, you'll be paying them a lot of money. So you pay one price for our product, and you've got it. And we've been updating it for, I mean, since we released it on Steam, I think it's about five years since we released it on Steam, and if someone bought it back then, they had not had to pay for anything else. They don't need to buy They can buy the DLCs, but they don't need to, and they've had constant updates. So, you know, it's one, we're not doing a subscription-based situation. We're just asking for one price fee uh, and with Steam. And we also do it on our own website. But you, can, you know, most people buy from Steam. We're always discounting the product. We do bundles as well. So you can always pick it up at a, a pretty good price. But, yeah, we're not. We're not the size of Unity. We're not the, we don't want to be the size of Unreal. 
Um, but we're a good little alternative that I think uh, separates out. We, we made it easy with a basic sort of scripting. Yeah. If you try and load up Unity or Unreal, try and do something, uh, tell me how you get on. Because <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks, or people say it is. Like, no, no, no. I certainly heard a lot of stories of that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, most people will get something running. I've got a character running around. Now what? You know? Um, that's not making a game. That's making a probably taking the, the basic demo off and, and changing it with some sprites. Mm-hmm. Well, um, do you have like an asset store as well uh, to go along with the app game kit? Uh, we do, although we're not totally uh, pushing that really because we, you know, we found that most people when they start using the product, they use their own sprites, their own assets, and there's plenty of assets out there. We focus on the engine mainly. Uh, but you know, we you can import uh, JPEGs, PNGs, uh, .x, uh, uh, 3ds, uh, FBX formats into our engine, uh, OG files for music and WAV files. So it's not like it's hard to get things into the engine at all. We've, we've d- dealt with all that. Um, so yeah, plenty out there on the internet. And usually, people who are making a game for themselves will develop their own assets or have an artist help them. Because otherwise, you you know, you're gonna, your game's going to look a bit odd if you're using other people's assets, um, and then trying to mix and match them can be a bit of a mess. Um, you know, usually the best games will tend to be um, have their own assets created for them. Right. But there's plenty plenty of sites out that do that, and we're not trying to focus on that. Well, it's more like um, uh, the asset flips of the world, you know, but like. Um, there are people like this is mainly like a unity thing, but you know there are people who will purchase the the pre-made assets and just put that on the Steam store. Like, yeah, but that's probably not going to result in a success, is it? It's going to result in lots of negative re- uh, reviews. Uh, I mean, that's a good starting point, I think, to get something happening. And you know, our, our product comes with some example games and, and demos. Um, but if you really want to have something successful, then you've got to put a work in. You've got to you've got to get the art in there. And it's ideally, you know, one programmer and one artist together, maybe a sound guy helping as well. Then you should be able to create something pretty cool. Um, having uh, expectations of taking someone's work and then just changing a few things, uh, people see through that pretty quickly. True enough. True enough. Yeah. Like- <laughs> those things are not put out, you know, because they have effort behind them. Yeah. yeah, the the trick to asset flips is that you don't need to make a lot of money on any of them. You just need to make a little bit more money than the assets cost. Mm-hmm. That's true. <laughs> I mean, there's all different ways you can do it, but, uh, you know, end of the day, the engine needs to, to run fast, uh, be reliable. Uh, that's what we're focusing on, providing that, really. And up to date, you know, uh, recently we had the GDPR update, um, which is the European thing that you've got to give your right, you know, the OK to. Um, anyway, we, basically uh, we have AdMob integration and uh, versions of Android. So we have to keep updating all these uh, third party SDKs in our engine. If you're using an old engine that doesn't do that, then, um, you know, you're going to be behind the, the, the te- technical side. On the, you need to be on the right side of things. Mm. Is it a difficult task keeping all of the different iterations of App Game Kit uh, current? Um, no, because we uh, at the start of the year, we I think it was the start of last year actually. We we um, actually doing the builds was quite a lot of work. So then we all tried to automate as much of, of it as we can. So really, within half a day, we can make a new build and then uh, get that out to our customers. Um, usually what we're doing though is we're checking our forums, seeing if anyone's got any issues, uh, fixing any issues that people come across um, and making sure that it's maintained and up to date and then, you know, uh, adding features um, that seem to be the most popular requested really. Like at the start of the year we, we added AR control, so AR kit and AR core went into App Game Kit so you can create your own AR apps. And that wasn't easy, you know. Those the AR kit and AR core weren't quite finished by Google and, uh, and Apple, and 
they caused us a bit of trouble, but yeah, they settle down now. Mm. But that's that's the pain we take away. We give you, you know, a call, set up AR call or something like that. I can't remember what the call is, and then it just does it, and then you know you can have a 3D object and, and an AR app up and running without you really having to know how to call the SDK. So I think, you know, hobbyists is ideal for maybe the more technical developers, they would make use of the C++ libraries. Well, uh, I suppose the question beckons is, uh, has anyone actually taken advantage of the C, C++ libraries to your knowledge? Well, that game you're showing on Twitch uh, now, that mm -hmm. is 1982, that is actually written in C++ using libraries, that developer prefers to work in C++. So um, he did that game and also Echoes Plus. Echoes Plus. Um, yeah. Those are the two app game ca games we reviewed like last month. Or okay. Yeah. Well, I've got a little uh, surprise for you. There's a new Echoes coming very soon. Yeah, yeah, um, Echoes 3. All right, you've heard of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I saw it like it was being advertised when we were uh, doing the uh, Echoes Plus review. Right. So this is going to use the 3D commands of our game kit. And uh, yeah, it's as crazy as as mine. Well, I I I feel like my eyes are bleeding after I finish playing it. And it's a bit like that again. Lots of visual effects, lots of 3D, lots of yeah. You got to focus and concentrate. So that's coming soon. But yeah, there's uh, there's lots of people doing all sorts of without game gear. I mean, you know, it's actually uh, you sort of hear about it after the event sometimes. I mean, some guys have there's a guy in uh, Netherlands. He used it for. Uh, um, uh, a sort of museum piece where I think it was back in 1950s there was, there was this massive flood and there was like this helicopter that was rescuing people so he did a simulator using the 3D side of uh, our game kit and built it into this sort of simulator in this museum so that was really cool to see that um, but if you go on our forums and look at the showcase section you'll see people uh, posting the, what they're doing and that's the great thing about communities while well, they share how they're doing stuff with the code, so you can quickly learn the best practices, really. How to, and if you've got a problem, there's loads of people there to help. Indeed. And um, is there any difference between like the mobile versions of App Game Kit and the uh, desktop version? Well, the mobile version was sort of created to sort of you know make people more aware of the, the desktop version. You can with a tablet program on the mobile. I mean, and you can also plug in a Bluetooth keyboard. Uh, you can't make APKs. You've got to use the desktop version. But the mobile version is free. So just download it from iOS or Android. Check it out. It's got demos in there. It will give you an idea of, of the scripting language and, and what you can do with it. I also know there's also a free version for the Raspberry Pi. Yes. Is yes. You just need to register with our website and you get that for free. Now, is that like developing for the Raspberry Pi or like on the Raspberry Pi? Uh, yeah, it says Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pi version, which will create versions of your game that will work on Raspberry Pi. Gotcha. <laughs> right. Anyway, um, Petty Fan, you're our computer programming uh, expert here. So do you have any questions about uh, the App Game Kit? I can't hear you. <laughs> no, it's it's, oh. it's is he muted? Is yeah, I accidentally out? muted myself because dog. All right. Um. Yeah, I don't really have many questions. It just seems like one of those tools like you could probably let loose in your like high school computer lab or something like that. Oh yeah, that's another point to make. It's totally free to schools. So if you know a school, a college, a university, they can sign up on our website. And get App Game Kit for the courses. Yeah, because oh, I. Nice. And we also send discounts for all the students as well. Yeah, because I remember my um school. One of the like one of my like I think it was like junior or sophomore year. They started adding a computer development course. Uh huh. And I think App Game Kit was like one of the things they were looking at adding, as kind of uh -huh. like, you guys did all your work, you know learn to make video games if you get the curriculum done and stuff like that, you know? Mm. Well, that, that's, that's a great thing. You know, you can teach it quite quickly and students can have something 
on their phones. You know, the great thing is if you write in the tier one, we call it tier one, the basic, because there's tier one, tier two. If you write it in the basic script, you compile it. You can also broadcast it to the player. So you can download this player app that will sit on your iPhone or your your Android device. And over Wi-Fi, it will transmit the game to the player. And so as soon as you press that broadcast, it compiles it. And within seconds, you can play it on your device and you can test it out. So you can sort of take it away from your lesson and show your parents and your friends what you've made. So and like, I pretty... think they were also working with C plus or whatever, so they could also mm -hmm. work with that integration as well. That's right. We've got the libraries for C plus plus. So yeah, it's great. For, it's great for that because it, you know, if you actually teach programming in schools, if the students don't actually produce anything for ages, then they're not really that engaged in it. But if they can come into first lesson and they can have a sprite moving around the screen with just a few commands. Their imagination is going to think, oh, wow, I did that. And now if I do this and do a bit of collision, I, you know, I, I've done some uh, videos on YouTube and I show how to make um, a simple shooter, a little space shooter with one spaceship and a, a ship coming down shooting at you. I also did a full Tetris game. I did it because I'd never written a Tetris game. And it was a bit harder than I thought, actually, because Tetris <laughs> is quite tricky. But it's all broken down across about eight videos. So you can go through that, and you can download the projects and, and compile them and, and see them as well. Um, so, yeah, ideal for... That's why hobbyists and, and beginners out game kits are ideal for them. Hmm. Like, uh, now, uh, here's the list of supported platforms. Uh, iOS, Android, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, HTML5, and Raspberry Pi. Uh, hmm. Uh, my question here is, have you ever tried to get the App Game Kit uh, suite for consoles? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's hard enough doing it for all those platforms to start with, really. I mean, we're not big enough to do that. I don't think that there's a need there right now. The problem with consoles is they do move on. So you could actually s spend a lot of time doing that and, uh, and then find out you're a bit late. Um, yeah, I know. We, we I know what you're saying that if you write a really big game, you'd want to put it onto Xbox and and PS4. So, yeah, we don't do that right now. Um, not saying we won't, but um, right now it's not a, not a focus for us. I think we need to, we we're mainly focused on on mobile as a as a sort of core platform really. Because I think that's you know that's it's hard. I think it's hard for people to write something that's going to get traction mm -hmm. you know if you write a game okay well let's just see it on windows first okay now can you make that work on a on an android device if you get it on android you get it popular you get hundreds if not thousands of you know even hundreds of thousands if not millions of downloads so um i think that's the easiest route for people who are on sort of hobbyist um routes to to making something yeah i agree now, especially since, like, the hobbyist section for consoles kind of fell by the wayside, the Xbox uh, Live Indie Games section, the Xbox 360. Yeah. It can be, yeah, if you put your eggs into a big platform and that platform changes everything, right. you can be left really annoyed. <laughs> it's sort of happened a couple of times just in the past. So we are, we're cautious what we what we support you know we did samson barda and that just died a death and we were probably too early doing that so we, we we carefully choose which platforms we support and we don't do things that you know we 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 wouldn't be able to do it wouldn't be in our scope i think to do a ps4 engine at this time and who knows where ps4 ps5 are going to go i mean there's ubisoft even said that a ps5 might be the last console because it might go to streaming so You've got to think of these things far into the future, I think. Right. Mike, I don't know about Ubisoft's claims, but we'll see yeah. what the future holds. Yeah, streaming has been muted quite a few times in the past, but uh, not here yet. Um, yeah, I'm but... looking at the withered corpse that is game tap and on live, and like, yeah, we got waited to go. Oh, yeah, there. on live. <laughs> I forgot about on live, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but they could just be too early, you know. I think mm -hmm. uh, once the infrastructure's there, I think it probably does make sense. But 
Uh, I think there are other issues that will prevent streaming from ever being the dominant force in gaming. Especially, like, rural markets. Like, there are some places you don't really get internet, but, like, their kids like to play games. Yeah. Because, you know, with a game, you can just have the current update on the disc, throw that on there. Oh, hey, little Billy can play Call of Duty, even if it's just single player. Yeah. So... Although you probably need the 50 meg download update, yeah. <laughs> which is always the, always the case when you buy a game. Yeah, I suppose we'll see what happens in that direction. But I think anyway. games like you know Fortnite are pushing everyone to mobile on, on, online, aren't they? Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, there's still going to be dead areas around the world that uh, are going to struggle to catch up. Well, I mean Fortnite's on everything now. Yeah. So. Um, it probably doesn't matter except for the PlayStation 4 for um, Sony reasons. <laughs> but that, that's a rant for another day. I think it was rant was done. Uh, but anyway, uh, App Game Kid is not a, your only um, creation suite here. You've got, also got Game Guru and RPG World. That's right, yes. Yeah. So Game Guru came from our older FPS creator. We sort of change it into more of a generic sort of game maker and that continues to be developed and uh, there is a, a way to get your game guru levels over to app game kit with a, a dlc that we have for app game kit called the game guru loaded dlc basically takes all the assets from your game uh, crunches them down to smaller texture sizes and has its own source code for running that within your app game kit environment so that was actually developed by a, a third party from from the uh, community. Um, and then RPG World, that is more of the, you know, I don't want to program, I just want to drag and drop, put things down type of um, game creator. So we've got something for, for everybody. So you've got the I'm game kit is more the programming sort of person. Game Guru is... It's drag and drop, but also has scripting in it. RPG world is very much all drag and drop, and then story building within that. And uh, from the sound of things, they each have a different focus. Like from what I see here, app game kits for the hobbyist, uh, game gurus. Uh, just from the screenshots, looks a bit more um, elaborate um, with the FPS stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and RPG world, well, it's kind of in the name, isn't it? Um, though I suppose I should ask, what kind of RPGs can you create? Like, is it um, Western style JRPGs? Um, I'm not an RPG uh, type of player. <laughs> it's not my project, but uh, okay. essentially, you are create you you can level up as you play during the game. You can get loot and drop boxes as you you know you improve your character. Uh, you can create your own worlds that have portals that jump around to different you know levels that you create. You can put enemies down, you can put objectives down like you know uh, go and get me, you know go and kill those guys over there, they'll drop something and then you can then have access to this portal and go to this world. And you can put your own story uh, text into so you meet somebody or you open a new door, uh, you can create a whole story around it and there's people sharing these stories their own games via Steam Workshop. So the great thing is that uh, the core product is free to download on Steam. So download it, try it out. If you want to do the creation side, then that's a, uh, that's a creative DLC. Um, so um, does the RPG World stuff connect with uh, the other game creator? No, it's very much standalone. Uh, makes yeah. sense. Makes yeah. sense. Since uh, this is going for a very specific genre yeah it's otherwise you can break the game if you let people start changing how it works so it's very much self-contained it's all about people making their own games within a sort of self-contained rpg themed uh game creator a bit like disney um infinity game creators yeah hmm Right then, um, I'll see if my colleagues have any other questions here. 
I do not. Yeah, I think we covered most of mine. I was going to ask about uh, how much it was just for phones and stuff as opposed to consoles or computers. So, and we got that. So, yeah, the mobile version is totally free. Mm -hmm. All right. So I, I think we've covered everything we uh, intend to cover. Like, you know, um, once again, uh, Rick, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. It's been a pleasure. No, no problem. No problem. I mean, um, maybe we'll have you back on the program when, when a major update happens to one of your uh, development suites here or if you develop a new one. Um, That'd be great. Yeah. Indeed. Anyway, um, yeah, the products are RPG World, Game Guru, and the App Game Kit. You can get free trials of the App Game Kit and RPG World on the um, the Game Creators website, like, uh, and you can also get Steam versions of this. Uh, like there is a thing called the Game Creators Collection that is going for $114.93. It has Game Guru, Game Guru Mega Pack 1, Game Guru Mega Pack 2, App Game Kit Easy Game Development, the original App Game Kit Tutorial Guide Volume 1, App Game Kit Giant Asset Pack 1, and App Game Kit Giant Asset Pack 2. So if you're interested in um, getting into game development, this is a pretty good place to start, right? Uh, especially if you're aiming to develop on, say, the PC or PC platforms uh, or mobile. Um, definitely recommended here. Um, so you know, if you're interested, be sure to download one of the free trials and see if this is right for you. All right. Um, now, I'd also say that, uh, you know, I... I usually hear from people who say I started off when I was a teenager using Dart Basic and now I work in the games industry. So, you know, it's a bit like me when I got my ZX81. You've got to start somewhere. And if you just start to program some basic sprites across the screen, you will quite quickly learn how games are put together. You're not going to be able to write a game day one. Uh, you're going to learn it in stepping stones, like anything, like learning a language. Uh, but it's it's surprising how many people started with us back in the you know 1999 or wherever we started, and then they, they a lot a lot of them were kids you know teenagers on our, on our forums, and then you know they've, there's a guy I know he he works for Motorola now you know hmm. uh, as one example, and um, the great thing about programming is that you never stop learning, it, <laughs> and but and as you learn something new. You just get stronger and better, and your style of programming improves. You'll make loads of mistakes, like anything. You know, a lot of riding a bike is you're going to fall off loads of times. That's the same thing with programming. You'll you'll write loops that just don't, will not not you won't be able to get out of, or they'll be dead slow. But then you'll learn. All oh, right, there's a better way of doing that. And hopefully, with Google and the internet on hand, all these answers are there already. So, you know, I had to learn the really hard way. There was no one to ask. There was no internet, and I just wanted to do it. So, if you want to get into games programming, you know this is a good place to start. Indeed. All right. Um, I think. I just wish I had more time to program. Really, because I have to run a business. So, you know, maybe <laughs> when I retire, I'll be programming again. <laughs> possibly. Possibly. Yeah. Like, um, anyway, see the screen. Anyway, that'll about do it for this installment of Fragments of Silicon. Be sure to tune in on Sunday for our usual review session. And until then, I wish you good gaming. <laughs>